I'm really interested in how the hallucinogenic background contributes to host microbe interactions. Why are we interested in them? Many of you who are here, it's funny, he just showed this picture. Um, we're interested in the microbiome. This is a collection of microbes that live in complex communities that interact with each other, and they interact with the host as well. We study this um, as a, we study Civilac as a model for uh, humans because humans are uh, really genetically complex. It turns out, evolutionary conference, I know that one individual is not um, genetically identical to another individual, even if they come from the same family. So many of the models that we've been using up until now have been, um, have been inbred models where the animals are genetically identical. We wanted to switch it up and use a model that had genetic variation in its background. The microbiota is really important for our host health. It helps us digest our food, prevent colonization by pathogens, which is something I'm interested in that I'll talk about in future conferences, and they also stimulate the immune system. They recruit these innate immune cells, uh, uh, neutrophils, that come along and sample the microbes and convey to the rest of the body that you need to mount an immune response or not mount an immune response. Um, the my gut microbiota and the immune response are in this really delicate balance, and when they come out of balance, uh, we have things like inflammatory bowel disease. So here I have uh, this graph showing uh, the variation in the gut microbiota in somebody who's healthy versus a patient who has inflammatory bowel disease. And then you can also see that the, in, uh, there's inflammation in a patient who has ulcerative colitis compared to somebody who has a healthy and healthy gut. For those of you who are into histology, uh, all of these, um, many of these little purple dots are actually neutrophils that have invaded this gut and changed the actual morphology of the gut. There are a lot of genes that are involved in these inflammatory bowel disease. You will all be quizzed on this later, so I hope you can read this tiny font. What you really should get from this is that these are really complex diseases. There are a lot of genes that contribute to this. This isn't one gene or another. So if you're going to study something like inflammatory bowel disease, it helps to have a genetically complex um, a model to work on. So we're using Sickleback. For those of you who are at this conference, I don't need to explain that Sickleback are, um, have a lot of natural genetic variation. We're taking advantage of that. Uh, some other things that we really find interesting about Sickleback is they have these large clutches. So we get 200 fish from a single mating of a male and a female, which is really helpful for um, reproducing adults. Our juveniles are optically transparent, so I can fluorescently label immune cells, and I can fluorescently label uh, bacteria and see how they interact with each other in fish up to the juvenile stage. Um, of course, their evolution and development is thoroughly described, um, and they share many pathways involved in host microbe interactions and immune responses with mammals. I like to remind people, we actually evolved from fish. So using fish as a model for human disease kind of makes sense. Important for my studies as well, Sickleback have a uh, system, a digestive system that's very similar to humans with an esophagus, a true stomach that's not found in all fish, and then an anterior and a posterior gut that's separated by, by a junction. So I was interested in host microbe interactions. I wanted to be able to examine what the host looks like in the absence of microbes and then in the presence of complex microbial communities and in the presence of individual microbes. So I adapted a protocol from a uh, zebrafish protocol in which I can surface sterilize the, the um, I can sterilize the eggs, the surface of uh, uh, sickleback eggs with PDPI and bleach, and then I can raise these fish in the absence of microbes, so our nice little germ-free fish, um, up to 14 days when their egg yolk sac is absorbed by the host. I can then take these I can also take these germ-free fish and add back microbes. These are not drawn to scale, they, the microbes are tiny, but I can add back com uh, complex microbial communities. These are con our conventional fish, or I can add back specific uh, types of microbes. Uh, these are mono-associated fish. And then I can study how the host responds to these microbes. I developed a number of tools as a postdoc to study the interactions between the inflammatory state of the host and microbial diversity, including a neutrophil stain. Each one of these brown dots is and so I can count how many neutrophils are in the gut. We can look at microbial diversity by 16S sequencing, and I, uh, I also plate my microbes to be able to recover these individual microbes and add them back to my host to determine how individual microbes or small communities affect the host. And then I worked with uh, Dr. Clayton Small, University of Oregon, um, to isolate 
have, um, interestingly, they do have uh, some microbes that are found in humans that are absent from uh, superfish and mouse microbiome. So we're really interested in following up on those. We did some fixing up analysis of populations of sizzleback caught from the wild in Oregon. We looked in oceanic and a freshwater population. For those of you who aren't familiar with sizzleback, there are many populations that have been separated for thousands and millions of years. They are still the same species. We can breed them in the lab, but they have different genetic backgrounds
sterilize the surface of the egg and look at their immune responses to microbes as well. So I'm really excited to start following up on that. We're also manipulating the uh, gut microbiota. So I, as I said, I have this really talented postdoc, Dr. Emily Lovecat, who just started with me this year. She received um, a, a grant from NSF to examine how chronic exposure to low levels of antibiotics um, that mimic the levels that are observed in wild habitats. So we're all shedding our uh, antibiotics we, uh, uh, take into our wastewater and then fish are swimming in them. So she is looking at how chronic exposure to low levels of antibiotics are affecting the gut microbiota of these fish that are in our wastewaters and then looking at how that affects the somatic development of these fish and their behavioral development. She's a behavioral, um, uh, she's a behavioral um, uh, evolutionary biologist by training. And then we can take the same system in which we raise um, predatonic and oceanic populations in the same um, treatments, control, or antibiotic, and we can look at high levels of antibiotics. So we have a graduate student who's starting with us, Paul Ryan Lucas, and he's going to be looking at exposing microbes, uh, exposing fish to um, uh, clinically relevant levels of antibiotics for short periods of time, and this is going to mimic what we see in kids when our, we take our kids to the doctor and our kid, if a kid has an ear infection, and the doctor throws antibiotics at us, and we gleefully give them to our kids because the ear infection is then gone. How is that affecting long-term development of our kids? So he'll be looking at that using simple math as a model, and we receive embryo funding for this. And then we're also interested in disturbing the um, uh, microbiota in other ways. So we started a collaboration with uh, Dr. Frank von Hibble, who's been amazing. I just spelled his name wrong, that's awesome. Um, but he's been uh, an amazing collaborator. And what we're doing right now is we're taking these, this nice collection of gut microbiota that I have, and we're exposing them to this environmental contaminant, perchloride. And um, perchloride is found in waterways all over the lower 48, and some waterways in Alaska. And we've um, tested uh, 17 different strains, and what we found is that perchloric, this being here, can affect the growth of our microbes in, um, uh, and our control, our uh, instant ocean control, and uh, no treatment at all, uh, grow perfectly fine. And thus far, we've looked at 17 different strains. I have 155 sitting in the freezer, so we're picking up the speed on this. We've looked at 17 strains. Ten of the uh, ten strains were affected either positively or negatively by the presence of perchloric, and no effect um, was found in seven strains, indicating our, that when we expose our fish to perchloride, we're going to see a shift in gut microbiota. Um, we're going to be testing that this fall. So in summary, does the host genus background contribute to microbiota membership? Yeah, but we need to look at this a little deeper. Um, we are going to be focusing uh, in the next year on recovery of disturbance from the gut microbiota. Um, and then um, we're also going to be looking at immune response to microbes in the next year or two. I was really lucky to work with some great people at the University of Oregon, Dr. 